everyone. Time for part two of the dwarfy stain. Now, I don't know if I mentioned in part one um, that Paul and Harold are their half brothers. Because in the part one, I introduced Harold, the talker, Paul, the silent, uh, Snorro, the dwarf, and Harold's mother and aunt, the Countess Frau Kirk. Okay, so Harold's, Paul's father was the King of Orkney and he was married and they had Paul, but unfortunately his wife must have passed away very soon after his birth and the father married again and his, uh, then he had his second son, Harold. Okay, and that's how that worked. But now uh, the King is no, also no longer alive. And so the Earls, they will rule over Orkney, but the question is who will rule? Well, it's going to be Paul because he's the oldest one. Now, as you remember at the end of the first part, um, Harold had gone down to the mainland of Scotland, to Edinburgh, to, to the castle, and there he met the Lady Morna, who he fell in love with. But she noticed that he was perhaps not the kindest person. He was a bit of a show off. Uh, he was quite mean to his staff and his servants. And she didn't really want much to do with him. But he invited her up to Orkney, to Kirkwall. That's the main town in Orkney, the capital of the Orkneys. And uh, she decided to go with him to see what it was like up there. Because maybe she would grow to like him or maybe she'd see him in a different way. When they got there, uh, she saw that, well, no, she was right about him all along. He was kind of a mean uh, uh, person, but she met his brother, Paul, who she actually fell in love with at first sight. And the same from Paul towards Lady Morna. And um, Harold, he didn't notice this, luckily. And still... He asked the Lady Morna if she would fall in love with him. If, perhaps, she would be his wife. And again, she refused him. And Harold tried not to show his rage and his anger, but Lady Morna saw it in the corner of his eyes and twisted his mouth that he was genuinely angry by this. And Harold stormed out of the castle, down the south road to the coast, and there he jumped in a boat which was the royal boat with the royal sails, with the royal crest on the sails. Clearly not a normal boat, but a very, very expensive royal uh, ship. And he sailed across to the next island, which was the home of uh, Snorro the dwarf. The dwarf was standing outside the dwarf stain by the entrance, looking out to sea. And he saw, coming from the distance, closer and closer and closer the sail of the royal ship and Snorro knew right away there's only one reason that Harold the talker would be coming across to his island he was coming to visit Snorro the dwarf because he needed something from him and Snorro the dwarf smiled twistedly to himself and with his crumpled hunchback he waddled back into the dwarfy stain to wait. And it wasn't long before Snorro the dwarf heard the hooves of the horses coming closer and closer, many horses, maybe eight or nine horses. And he heard the horses stop outside and he could hear them neighing and snorting and breathing heavily. And then he heard the voice from outside. Dwarf, come out, I need you. Harold commanding Snorro to come out of his stain. And Harold from outside, he heard this voice coming out. Who is it speaks to me in such a way that I would come out like a servant? Be gone with you. And Harold outside, not used to being spoken like this. Dwarf, I command you to immediately leave your stain and come outside. Command me, you say. You can command me all day. You beg me to come outside before I come out of this stain. Harold looked around. He was surrounded by his servants and his bodyguards. They were looking at him. And now the pressure was on. What was Harold going to do now? 
command again when it was clear that Snorro was not going to come out of his sting. Harold stepped down from his horse and approached the dwarfy sting. Now you can probably see in the picture of the dwarfy sting that outside there's like a little smaller stone, like a little kind of a table or something. As Harold got close to that, Snorro's crow, the black raven or crow, flew out and perched on that small stone, looking at Harold. Look here, cried Harold. I command you to come out. And before he could get another word out of his mouth, the crow turned towards Harold and said, Say please. Harold was astonished. He'd heard of birds talking before. Sometimes crows, minor birds, maybe he could say one or two words. But say please. Look, I don't know what trickery this is. Say please. Harold looked around. His servants were looking at him expectantly, waiting to see what he was going to do now that he's been given an order by this bird. Harold knew he couldn't look weak in front of his, his men. He sent them off. All of you, go many m yards back down the road and wait for me there. I will be back presently. That means back soon. His men rode off and Harold stood forward. Please, Snorro, come out of the stain. And he heard it from the crow again. Snorro the Great. Please, Snorro the Great, please come out of your stain and speak with me. Just then, Snorro came out of his cave, his small twisted body, but his beautiful face looking up at the Harold. Ah, Harold, it's you. I wondered who was here. He lied, knew who it was the whole time. Yes, Snorro, I thank you for seeing me, oh great Snorro. Um, I don't have much time. I've come all the way across here because I require from you need a love potion. I know it. How can you know this? There are very few reasons people come to me, Harold. You need a love potion. To give to the Lady Morna, if I'm not mistaken. And in his hand, Snorro was holding the large black book bound with metal clasps. Harold had no idea what kind of magic was in this book, but he knew enough that he just had to agree with Snorro. Yes, that, that's what, here it's here, I prepared it for you already. And he handed over a small bottle of liquid. Harold took it and paid Snorro, went back to his men, got back on his ship, and Snorro turned back, watching him leave and chuckled to himself. <laughs> Harold did great. Went back into his stain. Harold got on his ship and went all the way back to, um, to Kirkwall and there that evening as they sat down to dinner, he and Lady Morna sat down to, to dinner, Harold tipped the love potion into her wine. Lady Morna was getting herself some meat from a tree when she saw out of the corner of her eye the movement as he put it in the wine. She saw it, she suspected something. So that whole evening as she pretended to drink she didn't let a single drop touch her lips. And when Harold looks away, she managed to pour the wine into a, into a plant that was nearby. Mm -hmm. And Harold was looking at her expectantly. She realised, well, what could be in that wine? Poison? No. He didn't want to poison her. A love potion for sure. So she decided the best thing she could do was to pretend that the love potion was starting to take effect. So she smiled at him and she was a bit kinder to him and she had a more smiling face and smiling eyes and she was a bit friendlier towards him. But in truth, she was a little bit afraid of someone who would stoop to a potion. Harold, for his part, was very happy. The potion is working. This time next week, the potion will have taken its full power. She will be in love with me. We will marry. And even if the potion should wear off, we'll already be married. <laughs> the future is looking good. And what she didn't know was that evening, the Lady Morna had met up with Paul, told Paul the whole story. She told Paul that she was in love with him. 
Paul asked her to marry and she agreed she would marry Paul and that's where we leave the story for today the lady Morna who to marry, wants to marry Paul Harold thinks that the love potion is taking effect Snorro the dwarf he's going to come back later but in a very terrible way as I tell in the next part of the dwarfy steam. I hope you enjoyed it.